All right, Ayman, we have a little over 50 participants. I think you can kick us off when you are ready. Okay, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm Iman Kennerly um, with uh, Prosper Africa. I'm the Senior Advisor for Transactions. Uh, thank you for joining us for our early stage investing in African startups event today. Um, just want to start out by uh, talking a little bit about why we're here, talking about Prosper Africa and you know what we have ahead of us in today's discussion. Uh, Prosper Africa is a U.S. government initiative which aims to increase two-way trade uh, between African and American investors and companies. One way that we propose to do that is by creating new tools for the U.S. government and for the private sector to address gaps in the market. The virtual deal room is one of those tools. It aims to address the gap in equity funding, especially for early stage African companies. While the Development Finance Corporation, a US government agency that is a part of the Prosper Africa Initiative, uh, did launch a equity funding tool, which it added to its toolkit uh, recently, that tool is not necessarily a catch-all for all um, equity funding needs continent-wide. The virtual deal room uh, is a, a new tool uh, that is able to uh, help fill in gaps there. Uh, with the virtual deal room, uh, we have a created an online platform which enables vetted investors to connect with companies uh, that are engaged in fundraising. We have um, over 700 uh, registered users. Um, and 55, approximately 55 live deals uh, on the platform. In the first year, we've had uh, around, uh, well, we've had three direct uh, success stories come out of the virtual deal room. Um, and the uh, sectors that are covered by the virtual deal room, um, you know, are, um, you know, really show the, the variety of opportunities uh, in, in the African investment space. Uh, some of the larger concentrations that we featured have been in uh, healthcare, logistics, and uh, technology and, and communications. Um, in addition to this platform uh, marketplace that allows for connecting investors and companies, uh, we've also been able to uh, provide um, technical assistance and um, uh, assist with the fundraising efforts of companies. Uh, we've also been able to help investors with their due diligence uh, when they're looking at some of these investors. Uh, so there are some uh, other uh, ways uh, in addition to uh, just connecting companies and investors that Prosper Africa's virtual deal room uh, has been able to help parties. Um, on, on your screen, uh, you can see uh, an example of uh, how deals would be listed on the, the virtual deal room. And you also see the link to uh, where you can uh, find the actual virtual deal room online. Uh, so today, uh, pleased to give you a taste of the Prosper Africa virtual deal room, uh, while also showcasing thought leaders and practitioners in the venture capital space focused on Africa. Uh, so to start off, start us off, um, I'd like to present one such thought leader that we're going to invite to make opening remarks, and that is Stephen Grimm. Stephen is a managing partner at Lateral Frontiers. Lateral Frontiers is a mission-driven venture fund for early and growth stage opportunities in sub-Saharan Africa. Lateral invests in technology-enabled businesses that solve significant pain points across critical infrastructure, including financial services, healthcare, education, and energy. He is a seasoned entrepreneur and investment professional with 20 years of experience investing as a principal and a fund manager across the globe. 
Stephen has extensive experience in real estate development, energy, and venture investing. Prior to co-founding Lateral, Stephen was a director in the office of the president of Guyana, where he held responsibility for the implementation of their low carbon development strategy and the execution of large scale initiatives in the energy and infrastructure sectors. Stephen started his career in real estate at the Moynihan Group and later co-founded the private equity firm Capstone and Equities. I present to you, Stephen Grimm. Well, Iman, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just going to try to share my screen here. Let me know if we have any issues here in seeing that. Is that okay on everyone's side? Uh, yes, we can see it. It's not in presentation mode, but uh, we can see. How about now? Is that better? Just want to confirm, is that in presentation mode now or are you not able, still not able to see it? Excuse me, it's, it's not in presentation mode. We can see it. Um, Let me just double check here why that's not working in presentation mode. There you go. That, that looks great. There we go. Well, great, great. Thanks, thanks so much for for having me. I uh, really appreciate uh, the invitation and the opportunity to present a little bit on um, on the African opportunity. Um, and you know, just a little bit more background. Um, we launched one of the first African focused VC funds back in 2017. Um, have been fortunate enough to make 23 investments. Had three exits and uh, are now beginning to deploy out of our fund two, which is a $100 million vehicle focused uh, specifically on FinTech and climate tech. Um, just a little bit more, uh, I began angel investing uh, on the continent in 2012 personally. And um, I think in, if anything is evident in, in what I present here today, it's the perpetual underestimation of the opportunity uh, historically. Uh, and I think that continues into the future as well. Um, so let's see if I could turn slides here. I think most of you know the African narrative here, and I, I just want to lay this out for purposes of context setting. Um, and, and why this is relevant is fundamentally the, the building blocks here are, are in place um, you have the confluence of obviously a young, urbanized, technology-enabled native workforce, um, coupled with what we think of as the sort of velocity or rate of change around a number of key factors, uh, notably capital, which we'll talk about uh, a bit, talent, and, and as well the experimentation. I think the other important point here to reference is that beyond just the velocity of change, that we know that Africa has arrived globally. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, when I first began writing these checks as an angel, I would say the entire market or ecosystem was probably $25 million. Uh, where we are today is tracking at close to $10 million expected for 2022. But last year obviously was a monumental year in that we grew 9X to $5.2 billion capital. Now, Valuations are vanity metrics uh, in our business. We know that you know founders and funds don't eat paper profits. But what's notable here is again the the quality of capital and tier one capital that's come into market uh, is incredibly important for the ecosystem. Um, and for the first time now, we have a significant amount of endowments institutions that are seriously looking at the African continent. Um, and you know this pace of change is continuing. You know this velocity of growth and momentum, this wall of capital as we call it internally, continues to go unabated. Um, and you know despite uh, what we believe to be somewhat of a global, global slowdown in late stage and early venture funding, um, even in Q1 of this year we saw 150% increase year over year between this year Q1 and, and last year Q1, despite the sort of global venture market only growing by, by close to 7%. So the other important rate of change and velocity of change is around uh, company formation. Um, 
And, and what we have effectively is a number of growth curves that have occurred. I think we could all agree that that first wave of innovation was around sort of a copycatting model of, of the X for Y on the African continent. And you know, that quickly sort of spawned um, what we think of as wave two, which effectively the infrastructure layer on which a number of the companies are now being built. And I believe we're now entering this third wave, this wave where it's no longer the nth iteration or nth version of a solution, but more about innovation at the frontier, more about founders that are solving technical challenges and companies that are building uh, infrastructure and market enabling technologies that allow companies to create consumption out of non-consumption. I think we're now finally entering that sort of maturation period. And the, the other aspect here around company formation, ideation, and obviously velocity of capital is the explosion of talent. Um, you know, when we sort of began in earnest tracking this in 2017, we've now are on pace to see 90 companies um, or sort of early innovation ideas of companies that have emerged now from sort of the foundational technology companies uh, on the continent. Uh, and we think that obviously that pace of change continues. Um, this is obviously core to this all being complemented by a lot of the supporting and enabling infrastructure groups like Prosper Africa, obviously accelerators and incubators that are in the market, but equally importantly, the, the maturation of the sort of angel and syndicate class of investors and founders that are now backing companies given that they have seen liquidity events uh, early from some of their early investments. And so where does that bring us? That brings us to a place where we have, again, this, this sort of reinforcing loop of capital leading to ideation, to company formation, to talent, uh, and then this growing exponentially, meeting another factor that change is happening faster. You know, we are at this sort of unique inflection point where for the first time, societal ships are being driven by technology and, and not the other way around. And, you know, I want to remind people that um, unfortunately, I did not invest in Paystack in 2016. And what I misunderstood and misappreciated was that the TAM and the growth of that company was going to outpace the actual market size by greater than 5x in less than three years' time. Um, we perpetually forget that ecosystems develop slowly and then happen all at once. Uh, China had its first unicorn in 2010, uh, and then it took five years to get to the, the next five unicorns. Uh, the year after that, I had 20. Southeast Asia did not have their first unicorn until 2014. By 2018, they had nine. And in 2021, they had 24. And we're tracking now 11 this year. And again, you know, these are vanity metrics, but they are important, again, for the narrative of a market, for the reflexivity of a market. Um, and you know, maybe just want to end on one cautious point around sort of where we are. Um, and, and it's just sort of I think we've just perpetually underestimated the role of disruption and innovation. And every time we say it can't get bigger, it does get bigger. You know, first there was the iPhone, then there was the App Store. The App Store traded a hundred billion dollar asset class under it of applications running on the iOS. Uh, global technology companies are now growing a double digit returns. Uh, we have multiple trillion dollar companies. I think none of these things we could have predicted 10 years ago. Um, we have crypto, which, you know, again, is a new trillion dollar asset class, uh, one in which, you know, I think none of us could predict what in turn that will deliver for us on the market or in other ecosystems. And I just leave you this one last point, which is that, you know, none of us could have known this, but in Nigeria, the technology sector contributed more to the country GDP than the oil and gas sector did in the last five years. And I think that's really important for, for policymakers and for those of us who are at the forefront of backing innovation in these ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you much, Stephen. Um, I guess like one of the key takeaways that I, I take from that is um, that the opportunities seem very tangible and not theoretical. Um, whereas I, you know, I think that um, a lot of uh, 
potential investors uh, look at it as a, a, a conceptual theoretical um, with uh, potentially a lot of uh, challenges that are not faced in um, other more uh, conventional VC markets. Uh, but what I what I heard you say and what I what I saw you uh, present are very tangible experiences and and uh, opportunities in the investment space, and that's very uh, very encouraging to see. Uh, with that, uh, we are going to uh, turn to our accomplished panel of VC fund investors and managers, uh, as well as uh, companies that are raising capital on the Prosper Africa virtual deal room. The panel is going to be moderated by Eva Yazari of Beyond Capital Ventures, uh, and, and Eva is a leader in the space. She's the co-founder and the CEO of Beyond Capital. Uh, Beyond is a women-led emerging markets impact venture capital firm offering a diversified portfolio of seed and series A companies in need to have sectors that are led by conscious leaders. Eva has 16 years of experience in investing for social impact. She was previously a vice president at Entrust Capital, a fund of hedge funds where she specialized in due diligence and portfolio construction. Eva is also an angel investor, the founder of The Conscious Investor, the co-host of the Beyond Capital podcast, and she is the author of The Good Your Money Can Do. Welcome, Eva. Thank you so much, Iman. Really, really great to be here with everybody. And thank you, Steve. Stephen. I couldn't agree more that we're at this inflection point where technology is driving social societal changes and it's not the, the other way around. Um, and this is, an, is this, this is an undervalued and underestimated opportunity, but I know that everybody that's here is here to learn about this opportunity. And the panelists that I will introduce in a minute are actively focused on this opportunity. So I think this is a great conversation that you've put together at Cross Boundary and Prosper Africa. Thank you so much for bringing us all into this space. So we are gonna take 30 minutes. This is gonna be CNBC style because we have to move fast, but we've got a lot of great people that can share their views. And then we will have a quick kind of five to eight minute uh, chat uh, question, chat, chat in your question session. Um, feel free to raise your hand and use all of the great functions that Zoom has provided us with. But um, just to dive in, I do want to just quickly set the stage. So Stephen did a great job of laying the foreground, but um, this panel specifically is you know, intended to be focused on the topic of early stage investing in African startups and building on a record-breaking 2021. So what does a record-breaking 2021 actually mean? Um, we did see an unprecedented volume of investment in African startups. This is more than $4 billion of funding um, was raised according to the um, Africa Big Deal uh, blog that, that I follow through 754 deals that were over $100,000. Um, so that was certainly a record-breaking year. But when we're building upon that record-breaking year, at the end of February, we were also at a billion dollars uh, allocated on the continent into, into startups um, and rounds that were over $100,000. So we are headed in a very strong direction um, for the continent uh, this year. And so what we will be talking about here today um, is really how we will build upon this, this momentum, how the innovators, the investors, the founders on this panel um, will be kind of either taking advantage of this momentum um, or, you know, finding opportunities in it, depending on where they're sitting um, within the ecosystem. So I'm going to briefly introduce everybody. I'll launch into a question and I'll have all of the panelists answer the first question and, and introduce themselves a little bit more in depth. First panelist is Coyote. Oye Wole. He's a partner at Ventures Platform and previously was head of entrepreneurship and, in, and, and innovation. Coyote, I'll, I'll come over to you again when we have the first question. So get ready to introduce yourself a little bit more in depth. 
The second panelist is my friend Barbara Ayayi, and she is the CEO and founding partner at Unicorn Growth Capital. Uh, we'll also be hearing more from her, particularly when it comes to fintech, um, as she is a she is an expert in that area. The third panelist is Hema Valab. Hema is a partner at 535 Ventures, um, which you will hear more about as well. The fourth panelist we have is Jean-Claude Gouess. And Jean-Claude is the founder at Moja Ride, a mobility as a service company for emerging markets powering cashless and clean mobility. Um, Jean-Claude's company, um, I think like all of the funds here as well, um, is listed in the uh, data room, uh, the Power Africa data room uh, managed by Cross Foundry. And then last but not least, we have Valentine Noroje, and she is the co-founder and CEO of Africa's Pocket. So welcome to all of the incredible panelists. As I mentioned, um, there has been a tremendous amount of momentum in our markets. And even at Beyond Capital Ventures, we, we ourselves went to IC on seven, seven separate deals over the past 12 months, um, which is exceeding our pace for how we are, are deploying our venture fund. So I would love um, to start with you, Coyote. If you could just you know, quickly introduce yourself, take a minute, and, and let us know, you know, what are you seeing when it comes to all of this momentum? Can we, can we really expect more of this momentum moving into 2022? Um, how is this looking from your seat? And then we'll go down the panel from there. Uh, sure, Eva. Um, thanks, Eva. Uh, my name is Kai Day, a partner at Ventures Platform. Um, essentially, we're an early stage fund and we fund some of the most compelling founders solving some of the hardest problems on the African continent. Um, We've been investing since 2016. Um, until date, we've done about 78, 78 investments. Um, luckily for us, we invested early in Paystock, which was acquired by Stripe. Uh, so, so, so we didn't miss out on that. Um, and we've been investing in a number of compelling companies. Uh, Piggyvest, which is probably the biggest consumer finance company in Nigeria. Trevor Greg, the biggest agri-tech companies. Um, some of the most compelling founders. And the way we tend to think about it is our core thesis is centered around the concept of non-consumption, which is how do we enable the millions of Africans be able to afford the most critical products and services they need to be able to build meaningful lives, right? And so we tend to think about funding companies that sort of like just advance, you know, non-consumption, making it possible for Africans to, you know, consume really important products and services. Um, yeah. And we'll be happy to obviously share, share more on this panel as well. Just, just because I want to draw out some areas I think the audience may find interesting. What does non-consumption mean to you? Uh, so interesting. So, so essentially, uh, non-consumption in, in, in simple term is just the inability of people, individuals and institutions to consume services or products are really important to them. So if you look at the West, right, you look at Europe or you look at the US, people can access decent education, right? People can access decent healthcare, people can ascend, access decent wealth plans. There's sort of like mobility, economic mobility. In Africa, that is still, that's still a distant reality for lots of people. Healthcare system is fundamentally broken. Education is fundamentally broken. Financial inclusion is almost non-existent, right? So these are things people should be consuming, but they are not consuming. So that's non-consumption. Uh, essentially, we then look for companies that have figured out a way to make individuals and businesses consume the service, either by leveraging technology and making it more accessible, more affordable, fractionalizing it, or coming up with an innovative business model that then make it possible for individuals and businesses to consume the services. Thank you for unpacking that for us. Um, Barbara, I'm going to come back to you at the end because we'll dive deeply into fintech in the next question. But Hema, can, can you just talk to us a little bit, tell us about 535 and also, you know, walk us through, are you, are you seeing this momentum continue from 2021? How is it playing out for you in your fund and your investments and maybe even your fundraise? 
Sure, thank you so much, Eva. It's lovely to be here. Um, so by way of a very quick introduction, I'm Hema. I am an engineer turned entrepreneur, now turned investor, and I've worked in the gender parity space for the better part of the last two decades. Um, you know, first through a nonprofit with Talent Pipeline, then spinning out to start what has become the leading um, female-led incubator and accelerator in Africa, coupled with our innovation hub and co-working space. So for me, the obvious next step was to raise a fund specifically investing in women-led companies. And to your point, and you alluded to this earlier around, you know, the first billion been raised in February already, um, but it's not just how quickly it's raised, it's, be, uh, it's a speed of the, the momentum, right? So it took seven weeks for the first billion to be raised in 2021. I think last year it was about 21 weeks, the year before it was almost, almost 48 weeks or something of the like. So it's not just the momentum, but it's the speed of the momentum. And I think we set on a really positive trajectory for capital inflow onto the continent. However, and this is the lenses through which I see the world through 535. And I mean, I think, I don't think these stats are new to anybody, but of the $4.9 billion that I got invested into Africa last year, less than 17% went to diverse teams and less than 1% of that capital went to single female founders. So for me, and I think it's, you know, it's not just about the right thing to do, but it makes business sense in tapping into this whole, there's so much potential on the continent with women led businesses that have historically been, you know, marginalized for various reasons. And I'm sure we'll dive into that. And it's really with that mandate that 535 Ventures was born. Um, so 535 Ventures speaks to knowing that if we add more women entrepreneurs to the African ecosystem, we could see up to a 5% GDP uplift by leveraging the 35% higher ROI that we typically see in you know, diverse teams over all male-led teams. Um, and the mandate of the fund really is female-focused, pan-African, tech-enabled, B2B businesses at a seed stage. Um, so for us, you know, we see the momentum we've done, we just got started. We did our first close um, on the 31st of March. Um, and, you know, we've done 10 investments already. So to your point about momentum, to your point about deals, they, they, their pipeline's not the problem, but how do we catalyze capital in a more democratized way, if you will, um, on this trajectory, let's bring the women along too. Thanks for that. We will be weaving in the theme of lacking capital for specific underrepresented groups on the continent throughout this conversation. I want to turn over to you, Jean-Claude. Tell us a little bit from the, the founder's perspective. Um, of course, tell us a little bit more about Mojaride, but um, you know, how, how are you seeing this momentum? You know, are you, is your phone ringing off the hook when you're looking for funding? Um, and I, you know, I say that more um, you know, as just kind of an example, but you know, where are you seeing this um, momentum continue from 2021? Well, I think it's, it's a great time to be a founder. Uh, when we solve a real problem, people are paying more attention. They're taking time to learn. Uh, until now, we talking to an investor in the West who was like, okay, we don't really know what you're talking about. We don't know, uh, but now we see a collaboration between Western investors and local investors. So the Western investors will rely on the local investor to kind of do part of the due diligence and they, they assume the local investor understand more the problem you trying to solve. So that makes the conversation a little easier. So going forward, I, I do expect more funding coming in and more deal closing faster because you have collaboration between investors from both sides. And I think this is a great time for, for, uh, for founders. And a sector like mobility, for instance, being a challenge, like right? for years, I mean, after COVID and everything, everybody thought, okay, mobility is done. Nobody going to invest into mobility. And then you see people coming back. So we believe um, the momentum will continue and we're seeing great founders doing great work and making it easier for uh, investors as well to, 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 to actually deploy capital. So I'm pretty optimistic that 2022 will continue uh, that same momentum. And we have great founders, great deals, big problem being solved. So uh, it's still pretty promising going forward. Thanks. I also want to point out um, your, your kind of 
geography and country is Cote d'Ivoire. We also have, you know, Coyote, who's primarily investing in many, many companies, but also Nigerian, Hema based in, in South Africa. Um, and then I'll be turning to Valentine right now, who is more focused on East Africa. Um, so we are kind of having perspectives from across across the continent, um, mostly sub-Saharan Africa in this, in this conversation. But um, I love the, the statement that this is a founder's market <laughs> as, as an investor, or it's a good time to be a founder. Um, you know, as an investor, I think there's a, there's a balance to strike there, but I do think that the power in the hands of the founders, and Steve, Stephen pointed out to us that, you know, the, the founders um, that started Jumia, for example, turn around and then invest that capital back onto the continent. I think it's, it's a really important part of the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. Um, so I think that that's great. Um, even though sometimes it's, you know, we're, we're sitting at opposite sides of the table as an investor. Um, Valentine, I would love to hear from you. Tell us about Africa's pocket. Tell us where you're seeing this momentum play out for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's interesting because my background is actually on the other side of the table. So I started out as an investor and then moved to entrepreneurship, which is the opposite of what most people do. Um, and like Stephen, I started investing in you know mid mid 2010, so around 2014, 2015. Um, and it is a great time to be a founder. So with Africa's Pocket, we're building a consumer finance business very similar to Peggy Vest and Kariwise in Kenya. And we focus on helping um, people manage their finances by helping them get more educated and then connecting them to interesting investment opportunities that can allow them to build their wealth um, and kind of, yeah, build the lives that they, they want to live. So sitting on this other side of the table has been interesting because we're seeing that there is, you know, this um, willingness of the local person to invest in our markets, but they don't know how to do that. Um, and what's happened with this momentum we're seeing in funding of larger businesses is that the founders of those businesses are investing in each other. So for me, when I was um, raising my friends and family, it turned out that majority of my investors were other founders um, who had recently raised their Series A and maybe B and were recycling that funding into you know, companies that were growing. Um, and that's been beautiful to see because it means that we also have more local money coming into companies, which is an issue that we primarily faced as a continent for a long time. Um, so I think that there's way more where this came from. I think you know, next year we'll be looking at thousands of investments within the first quarter. Um, and to Hema's point, I'm really excited. I'm really excited to see more female VCs focusing on female founders as well. Absolutely. Um, Barbara, uh, over to you. I, I, please, uh, of course, let us know how what the state of play is for you at Unicorn. But also, I want to just launch into another question because, you know, fintech is driving a lot of the interest in the deal flow on the continent. And um, according to Quartz Africa, about 60% of the over $5 billion invested in African startups, four or five billion last year went to fintech. So given that's your focus area, your area of expertise, unpack that for us a little bit. Sure. Um, so at Unicorn Growth Capital, we focus on investing in the future of FinTech, the future of finance. And we're, we're really at the intersection of TradFi, traditional finance and decentralized finance. So essentially what we think is important for driving the economy is financial services, which is really a basic concept. But from a tech perspective, that's what fintech is to the digital economy. It is really the foundation and the driver. And I think for the last seven years, we've seen that every company essentially has to leverage fintech in some way to be able to really expand and grow. We, you know, we talked about non-consumption. The primary reason people aren't consuming is because of financial services. And, and so solving the main problem to stimulate the economy um, is really important for the economy to grow. And I think that's why we've seen a lot of innovative ideas come through multiple industries. Um, embedded finance being really key. Um, a lot of companies in the healthcare space, agriculture, logistics are embedding financial services to drive growth in those sectors. Um, you know, within, within their ecosystems, these, co these companies and stakeholders need to be financed. Um, in order for them to participate in that ecosystem. And so 
just fintech is across the board. I don't look at fintech as a vertical. I look at it as a horizontal and an enabler. So we, we invest in, across industries, but our domain expertise, the value add we bring to our founders um, is really around fintech and DeFi. Um, we are in a world where um, there is a future of decentralization happening. And we are very much active in that world because um, that world is also trying to solve gaps that traditional finance just has not done. Um, we still have issues with cross-border payments across 55 countries. We still have a huge SME credit gap across all industries. You know, we still have a lot of devaluation issues. All of that is actually being solved by DeFi um, and crypto and the use of stable coins to power a lot of these platforms. And so we're heavily involved in that industry to, to drive um, the growth of the digital economy um, through this decentralized infrastructure. Um, so I think with all of that, that is the reason why FinTech will always be a key funding um, sector is because it reaches all sectors. Um, you know, Paystack, Flutterwave, these are all FinTech companies. And frankly, there's gonna be new Paystacks and new flood, Flutterwaves that are gonna power the economy, especially in the DeFi world, because there's a whole economy being built in that world that is um, you know, using different rails than what Paystack and Flutterwave are doing. And we, we want to invest in those companies um, for the next five to 10 years. Um, and then also just in general, from a female founder perspective, which is really important from what um, Hema said, you know, we are in a very disturbing situation where we are building a tech ecosystem that is excluding female founders. And FinTech sees a, the brunt of that actually. Um, in order for you to become a unicorn, you have to be leveraging FinTech in some way. And so for me, I'm very passionate about working with female founders that are building FinTech and DeFi solutions. And um, we've, you know, there are a couple of female founders we've backed. Um, one built an open banking platform um, and, and we're backing the one that's building a DeFi platform. And we want to see more female founders um, like you, um, Valentine, building, you know, you know, the future um, and, and backing them and, and getting more capital to them. So, so, yeah, I hope that answers all your questions, Eva. Yeah, no, I mean, that was a really, it was a really great primer walkthrough of the state of fintech and why, why it should be viewed as a horizontal. And I absolutely agree with you. Um, just to double click a little bit more on the gender piece, Hema was asking uh, behind the scenes, you know, what other VCs are doing to close this gap? And just to kind of recap, sounds like you also have a focus on female founders um, like we do at Beyond Capital Ventures. Um, so I think that the selection of more female founders, particularly in areas where they are not and seeing the opportunity to include more women where they are not um, is one way to really look at and, you know, solve for this challenge of lacking amount of capital going to women. I also I want to double click even more on fintech and then we'll move on and we'll zoom out a little bit. And the reason is we have a question from the audience that um, I think flows really well where we are right now. And that is, what is TradFi? Tra they say traditional investment finance and investment banks and brokerage houses. How can they play in this fintech space? Um, are there specific services that FinTechs require that banks and brokerage houses are providing, um, you know, where are these partnerships actually happening? Um, I'm actually gonna turn over to Coyote to answer this one. And then um, Barbara, you can add on if you have anything afterwards. Oh, uh, sure, sure. I, I believe the question is essentially what, what roles can um, traditional financial institutions play within the, the fintech ecosystem? Um, Correct. And, uh, yeah, so, so, so a number of things, right? I mean, um, the, 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 the traditional institutions have certain advantages, right, uh, which, which we have to recognize. First is um, on the regulatory side, and, and I mean, for, for any financial player across the world, um, it's, it's deeply regulated and in Africa, more so as well, right? Um, the big traditional finance, financial houses understand the regulatory landscape. They're, they most likely have licenses and more importantly, they understand how to navigate the, the regulatory landscape. So, so that's, that, that's a massive advantage. Um, the second is also, they also have lots of institutional knowledge, right? Um, 
having worked with customers and businesses for for some of them hundreds of years, right? Um, and so they have those relationship, they have those infrastructure, they have those institutional knowledge, which I think are all advantages, right? Um, the flip side, what they do not have is that the technology, the nimbleness to be able to build and experiment and essentially, you know, interact with the consumer and just constantly iterate. Um, and I guess the, a few way I've seen them solve for this is, I mean, um, two years ago, we, we, we did the uh, an innovation program with arguably one of Nigeria's biggest asset managers, ARM, which sits on a, over a, three, a trillion naira in asset under management. And it was the same question. They, they were essentially looking for ways to be able to get into the fintech ecosystem and essentially, you know, build products that are technology driven and, you know, get a piece of the action, right? Um, and it became quickly obvious to them that they, they did not have this ability internally uh, just because of the way they were structured, right? And so we worked with them in essentially creating a program that leveraged the best of both worlds, right? You, you have institutional knowledge, you have the customer base, you have the capital, you have the regulatory framework. How about you partner with the younger companies? They have the technology, they have the speed, they have new ideas. And essentially, both of you can you can bring your advantages. They can bring their advantages, and both of you can deploy product into the market. And we've had some successes from that, right? Where uh, we've had companies build new um, digitally driven wealth managers, robot advisory products, which is backed by some of those big, which is backed by this big financial institution, right? So I guess one area where they can get in on the action, essentially partner with, with startup um, existing companies that, that are building innovative technologies, maybe create some sandbox where these companies have access to their, their licenses, the, they can leverage them to expand their customer base and it's sort of like a win-win deal. So that's sort of like one way I've seen, I've seen this happen. Um, another way is essentially invest invest in some of those companies, right? And I know in Nigeria specifically, their typical the regulatory frameworks around financial institutions investing directly in technology companies. However, I've also seen that there's a work around that. And in recent time, um, I've seen a few big banks in Nigeria actually sort of like you know deploy capital directly. Into, into fintech companies, right? Um, and even invest in, I mean, for, for instance, uh, for in our fund, we actually have a few banks eventually coming. And it's interesting that five years ago, we went to them and told them what we're trying to do. And they're like, oh, no, we're not interested in technology. And, and five years after, they're like, oh, we need you to take our money. We, we don't know how to spot the right companies. So essentially, another way is to partner with funds and essentially um, deploy some capital uh, 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 via funds. Um, in cases where the banks have tried to internally build technology, I, I, I've not seen it worked, right? Just because there's just a there's just a there's just a chain of bureaucratic system, right? And and, and startup typically are, are designed for speed, right? Um, and just like that constant iterative process, right? So um, I guess a good way for for traditional agencies to to, to work towards this essentially um, design a program that allows you partner with some of the best founders, best technology driven founders. Um, figure out a way to invest in some of the best technology-driven fund. That way also you then get, you know, the additional data, the additional insight, which then allows you maybe double down or hold more positions in this company. And so whatever upside comes from that company, you also benefit from that upside. But more importantly also, you can then talk around partnering and maybe white labeling that technology to, your, to also your customers. So that way also you also can drive innovation internally. Um, and, and I guess the third way is also create some form of framework um, either a sandbox or that, that makes it super easy for technology companies to partner with you. Because uh, on the other side, technology companies do not have, the, they have to start from scratch in acquiring customers. Banks have millions of customers at scale, millions of businesses currently banking with them, right? So um, I, I think there definitely can be a win-win deal where the bank is providing its advantages for to those companies to leverage and obviously maybe take some equity stake or, or, or essentially get some technology uh, uh, in return. Thank you. That's helpful. I, I am going to switch gears now because we only have about 11 minutes together um, for this session and we could spend the next you know, hour and a half together discussing the, these topics. I'm staying a little bit more at the investor level. Um, I would love for you, Hema, and then Valentine as well to weigh in on this because um, you did touch about this in your early remarks. How can investors 
ensure that all founders are included in their processes. Um, maybe just to quickly share what we're doing at Beyond Capital Ventures, we are giving a percentage of our profit share to every founder in the portfolio. We're creating a community of owners and, and the, you know founders that are a part of our success. And therefore in that community, we do believe that we will have access to you know, other founders in their networks. We will have access to more authentic sources of deal flow. Um, and, you know, we already don't source from anywhere outside of the continent, of course, but um, I think that it'll really help drive more kind of, you know, underrepresented groups coming into our pipeline um, just through referral by our existing local founders. So I would love to hear from you, um, Hema, take it first, and then we'll turn it over to Valentine. Sure, thank you so much, Eva. And I think, yeah, and I love, I can't remember who made the comment earlier, but the thing around it being a founder's market, right? So keeping in mind that gone are the days where the VC sits on their pedestal and they're able to choose the companies they want to pick. Founders are now choosing investors. And I think that's important. Um, but I think parallel to that is, you hear the concept of, you know, we're all fishing in the same pond. And while I think the, you know, accelerators, you see what Y Combinator is doing, Seed Stars, Tech Stars, and all the, all the like, and you do the founder comes out of that, they're the most coveted, you know, prize in the, globally, but in the continent especially, we have to cast the net wider, right? So not everybody has access to these opportunities. The funnel is big. And by the time you're coming out of some of these very prominent accelerators, it's a really small um, percentage of the, the, the deals you see. The way we approach it is, and of course, I mean, I have to carry this with saying, I specifically look at this with the gender lens. Um, so part of the reason why I'm raising this fund is because we, I do run an accelerator myself that's been specifically focused on women in tech, but that's, it hasn't been built overnight. So I've been playing in this space for 17 years and you become, you know, female founders are finding us. And I think that's important. The other thing is around a fund is beyond, so you, yes, you have the fund, yes, you have who you're investing in, but there's a lot of other players in the bigger ecosystem. So at 535, we're also really deliberate around how we, the type of investors, the type of LPs we're looking for. And we've specifically lowered the barriers for women investors, first-time investors, entrepreneurs who have become investors because of the type of, one, having them leap into this world of LPs, but to the type of deals they then also have access and introduce us to and vice versa that we introduce them to from co-investment opportunities. So, you know, we can't keep doing things the same way and expect a different result. We have to look in places that previously have been, you know, have been, you know, marginalized or been absent. It's the, you know, we talk about, I know we'll talk about markets and geographies later, but from a geographic spread, we have to look at type of founders who, they may not be all polished yet coming out of the perfect accelerator, but that one step before, and how do you put in the work to get them there um, if you, you know, if they um, not just there yet, and it's a network effect. And I think across the continent, this ecosystem on one level is small, but it's also there's so much that we don't know. So I think we must be a little bit more open-minded and take a broader look at where we find these deals. I really appreciate the network effect um, comment. Um, thank you so much for that. Valentine, I know this is an area that you're focused on as well, even though being the founder of a former investor, give us your perspective. Um, so, I, you know, I really agree on the, on the network effect perspective because when I think about my, my own experience as a founder, something that we've done as female uh, founders in Kenya is we've, we've come together. So we have lunch, brunch once in a while, just to, you know, kind of share ideas, talk to each other, introduce each other to our investor networks and things like that. And I think that was the first big barrier that had to break because before you would feel like there's only space for one of you. Um, but, you know, kind of eliminating that risk has been really important in allowing these networks to be genuine so that you can actually really share um, opportunities with each other. So I think from the investor perspective, possibly that needs to happen a little bit more actively as well, where investors step in to create those safe spaces for women to be around because so many of us will remove themselves from the running in the first place because you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel like there's space for you, you feel like you'll be competing and all of these things. Um, so I think um, in order to invite, I mean, if you see, if, when you look at the numbers, it's jarring, 1% is just so, so small compared to the amount of money that came into the continent, it means that the effort needs to be, you know, needs to, to marry, you know, like the effort needs to be as big as the problem is. Um, and, and investors need to go above and beyond. So I'm, I'm really, really excited to see 
female VCs on this panel, because I think that's one of the biggest solutions is having somebody who looks just like you that you can talk to. And then I think the second thing that needs to happen is having these spaces that are specifically for women. And, and I think looking into the consulting industry, they've done this somewhat well, um, where some of these consulting companies, you know, they, they recruit with that specific gender lens. They literally go to the universities to find women and tell them about consulting and things like that. So it might need to go that, you know, that far down the, the funnel for there to be more at the end of it. Um, yeah, it's my two cents. Thanks for that. So we can't talk about momentum without talking about exits. And Stephen set up, you know, some of the the exits um, that you know I think a lot of this current momentum has have been built upon in his keynote. Um, I want to turn to you, Jean Claude. Um, when you think about you know how you will exit your company, how your investors will exit your company, what does that look like? Has it changed um, since I know you've been in market for a while? I uh, would love to hear that perspective from you. I think uh, depending on the sector you operate in, uh, opportunity for exit are now becoming more and more uh, available. Mojaride, we started as a, a fair payment company, so allowing people to pay for transportation easily. And then we added a financing for those same uh, transport operators. So then what happened is we are in a position today where we can create multiple level of exit from the same operations. So I do see uh, more mergers, uh, startup buying startups in Africa. So allowing the, the first investors to exit. And we see more uh, local uh, banks being in, in the FinTech sector, for instance, could you, we see more FinTech being bought out by bigger companies, or some banks, for instance. So I think this is, uh, it's gonna be, a, one of the main drivers of investment into local investment because people will start to believe that actually, if you invest in a startup, you can make money and get up because they see this happening. So um, I think this, this dynamic will continue. And um, as I said earlier, more local investors are, be, are being interested. Uh, foreign investors have, are partnering with local investors. I think this is really, um, going to be key to how the market evolve in the years to come. Thank you for that. Um, just to flag, there was also a question about uh, hearing more about Francophone Africa. Um, so to this uh, anonymous attendee who submitted this point, we won't be able to dive into it here, but please know, Jean-Claude, perhaps you want to connect and you can message him directly and maybe you guys can connect as well. Um, uh, I'm going to wrap us up unfortunately, even though I would love to spend this time with all of you by starting with you, Jean-Claude, since we're already talking, um, I wanna hear from you just what makes you most excited um, for the future of early stage investing on the continent this year? Um, give me a couple words around that. And for the others, prepare your responses so you can get <laughs> yes, your best ideas. What makes me really excited is we are majority working on one of the most difficult problems to solve has been transportation. And we see investors listening to us now because until now, most investors have shied away from transportation altogether because it's complicated in Africa, the corruption involved, but people are beginning to understand that there's a, an actual business case that can be developed to change transportation altogether. So investors are taking time to learn more about how uh, things are happening. So we think going forward, uh, unfortunately I believe many companies will fail, um, not because they're not great business, but because the, the problem they're working on can be solved in, by multiple tools in multiple ways. So if investors do not pay attention to the future of what they're invested in, I think there will be some kind of bubble that will uh, break us, explode at some point. But uh, to the investors from the English speaking country, I think it's a great time that people are looking at Francophone Africa as well as a viable uh, ecosystem to invest in. And uh, I get, I'm really excited because I believe transportation will be a key driver of the entire economy and investors who are kind of beginning to either logistic delivery, uh, commute, all these are different pieces of transportation that need to be improved. And there is a huge gap in that sector. And I'm really uh, excited to be part of that. 
Sounds like an incredible opportunity. Coyote, over to you. What are you excited uh, about in 20 seconds? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, a if, if, if few if you things, right? Uh, uh, firstly, is the fact that um, a third of the world population by 2100, 2100, right, will be resident in Africa. For me, I'm more excited about that future. We are one third of the world population is living in Africa. Massive. And the interesting thing, a huge chunk of them, over 70% will be under 25. Right, so huge population, massive working population. There's a ton of products and services we're going to be able to build for those companies. So I'm excited about the fact that it's early days. Uh, I think we're going to have 10, 20, 50, 100 billion dollar companies on the African continent. Um, there's an incredible amount of talent really happening and talent recycling, which the speaker spoke to early on when he alluded to people leaving junior to start companies. When I look at our portfolio, we're seeing companies leave people leave pay start to start new companies, and that's that's happening. When that begins to happen, it begins to sig signal some sort of maturity in the ecosystem. So the incredible amount of talent, um, the the vast population. And just the, the fundamentally broken nature of all the sectors in Africa, for me, represents a massive opportunity for companies to really build fundamentally, you know, strong uh, uh, and valuable companies. So that, that excites me. Thank you. I love that you address talent because I think a lot of people think, where is all the talent going to come from for all this innovation? But I'm glad that from your perspective, you're not seeing that be a bottleneck. Hema, would love to hear from you. What are you excited about? Sure. So I think, and I think to uh, paying on to Coyote's point about, you know, this is where the population is growing, right? But for me, that also means Pan-African. So as much as we're based in South Africa, we invest across the continent. And you mentioned, um, you know, this is largely sub-Saharan panel, but we invest in North Africa as well. We invest in um, Francophone Africa. And for me, what excites me is his, we're moving from this historically regional country, even city specific investing to cross continental pollination, because that especially at a seed stage is where you will see scale. You know, the fact that we have a portfolio that's based across the continent makes for M&A opportunities, it makes for acquisition opportunities. And this is how we talk about scale and growth of our businesses beyond just, um, uh, you know, other math means, but a geographic bold and growth across the continent is really what I see bubbling. Amazing. Barbara. I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. There you go. Um, so yeah, what I'm really excited about, I think is, be, you know, one thing we fail to realize sometimes is Africa to me is like, the, the, it includes the Africa diaspora, especially when it comes to talent, especially when it comes to transactions um, and, and commerce. Um, I think that's the exciting part is that there's a lot of global integration going on with the concept of Africa across talent, across startups, across transactions. And I think that's really exciting. Um, and so I think I'm really excited about the whole new wave of technology within DeFi and within finance. I think that's going to open up new business models, a whole new economy. Um, that's just, just going to be formed and, and people are, and it's going to create wealth. I mean, the, the big thing that comes out of this is wealth creation. Um, yeah. And there's just going to be a, a lot of new millionaires, a lot of new uh, smart and uh, people who get, um, put more money back into their communities and, and create more opportunities for, for Africans going forward across the diaspora. Absolutely. Excellent point. And last but not least, Valentine. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not much more to add. I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity for African money to stay in Africa for bigger retail participation as well in our financial markets so that, you know, the, you know, all the good stuff doesn't stay with LP types and we have more opportunities kind of opening up to um, the rest of the continent as well. And of course, more money to women. <laughs> for sure. I want to thank you all. I'm really excited to work with people like you who care about more than just shareholders and customers who truly care about all stakeholders and in looking beyond the traditional paradigm of what business can do for the world. So you all inspire me and I'll be taking this into the rest of my day and evening and the energy that we created here today. I apologize to the uh, participants that we didn't get to too many questions, but actually we did kind of touch on all the ones that came through. Um, I'm sure you can find all of us on, you know, LinkedIn um, and other channels. I know Valentine has a really 
awesome website as well, a personal website, but you can find all of us. Um, and I, you know, I'm certainly here for you. I put kind of the best way to reach me into the chat. Thank you, Prosper Africa. Thank you, Cross Boundary. I'll turn it over to you now. And thank you again to the panelists and everybody that attended. All right, thanks, Eva. Uh, there was a question in the chat about how Prosper Africa can help companies that are operating in Africa. And you know, I just wanted to say that Prosper Africa is comprised of 17 US government agencies, which include over 75 different tools that can help companies and investors uh, so you can contact Prosper by email. Uh, best way to do so is at prosperafrica.gov. All those tools uh, we can go over with you and uh, find the right tool and uh, help you access the tools. Everything from technical assistance, market research, political risk insurance, trade finance, debt capital, feasibility studies, the, the list goes on. Um, and you know, just to echo, uh, Eva, I definitely want to thank Stephen. Uh, thank you, Eva. Thank you, all of our panelists today, Pema, uh, Coyote, Valentine, Jean-Claude, and, and Barbara. Uh, it's apparent that closing the funding gap obviously requires best-in-class teams like all of yours, both on the investor side and exemplary investees. Um, and realizing these investments is going to require an appreciation for the dynamic opportunities and how to make those opportunities accessible to either side. And you know, I think that's what uh, the a lot of the insight that was shared today. Uh, and that's uh, a lot of the work that we're looking to do in Prosper Africa. So please continue to engage with us at Prosper Africa and also among yourselves in the investor and investee communities. Uh, thank you for joining us and have a great day.